set of metaphors and realities which is taken by and large from the earlier scriptures. John's readers were well versed in the Jewish Bible that Christians know as the Old Testament. Both the books of Ezekiel and Daniel contained apocalyptic passages intended to give hope to the Jewish people in times of despair. When the Babylonians conquered the Jews and enslaved them, Ezekiel sought to convey the message that God would protect his people and destroy their enemies. To accomplish this, he wrote surrealistic passages describing such things as a field of bones coming to life. And the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 2. The problem is when we take the Old Testament symbolism that St. John was thinking about when he wrote the book and tried to put it into the modern world and understand it in a scientific way, it just doesn't make sense. But some modern Christians think Revelation makes perfect sense. For them, it's not about symbols or coded language. It is about literal truth. For these people, Revelation is no myth. It is a living, breathing prediction of the end of the world that might occur at any time. You are saved by the Pastor and televangelist John Hagee of the Cornerstone Church in San Antonio, Texas, is direct in preaching to his congregation, telling them that at any moment, Jesus will call those who believe in him to depart this world. The Lord in the air. The next exciting thing that's going to happen to the church is we're going to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. Keep your lamps lit and your wedding garments on. We're getting ready to leave this place in the twinkling of an eye. Hagee and congregations like his around the world are adamant that the words of Revelation are not allegorical. Thank him that everything that you used to I don't believe they're allegorical. I don't believe they're metaphoric. I believe they are factual. I believe that there will be four horsemen of the apocalypse that will represent four different specific kinds of terror that will come upon the earth in rapid succession. The letters of John the Divine collectively add up to a story like none other in the Bible. No novel or screenplay could be more lurid and dramatic. It is full of devils and monsters, horror and slaughter. But could this amazing work also offer a promise of comfort and hope? For millennia, humankind has been plagued with a primeval fear that sends a shiver of horror down the spines of all who sense it. A horror that our world may be coming to a violent end. There are many people that feel that the natural disasters we see today are a fulfillment of prophecy. The story of Noah, the promise given by God, he said, I will never destroy the world again by flood. But that doesn't include earthquakes or fire that are described in the book of Revelation. For people who are certain that doom is approaching, the primeval fear has its origins in the final book of the Christian Bible. In it, John of Patmos describes fantastic visions of the future of the world. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. The figure on the throne is Almighty God. The seven seals secure a scroll that contains his plan for the future of the world. Jesus opens the seals, and as he does so, the verses of Revelation present a countdown to the death of the planet. The first four seals opened by Christ reveal the most famous characters of Revelation, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Each of these ghastly figures will lay waste to the earth in his own preordained way. The first, on the white horse, is bent on war. The red horseman spreads pestilence and disease. The black horseman brings famine and hunger. And the fourth, the
the Pale Horseman delivers cataclysmic annihilation of the world. The chilling image of the horseman is followed by a scene of angels emptying seven bowls and blowing seven trumpets, each ushering in a new welter of torments to be inflicted on the earth and its people. The bowls are poured out, and each time the bowl is poured out, another disaster happens. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth. The whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs drop from a fig tree. During this appalling time, the earth will be ruled by a creature of deception and malice. He is a servant of the devil and represents all that is evil. His appearance is one of the most memorable moments in the book of Revelation. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on his horns. He was given power to make war against the saints to conquer them, and he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. It's a figure that controls everything. Everyone is paying this beast homage. And this beast is dangerous, but everyone is acclaiming the beast as what is to be worshipped. Satan gives the beast its strength, and the beast uses it to slaughter the multitudes that follow Christ. Those who survive will be forced to show their allegiance to the beast by being branded on their right hands or foreheads with his mark. The mark of the beast everyone wears and, and, and the allegiance to the beast is symbolized by this mark. And the mark is represented by the figures 666. Six, six. And it marks everyone with its power and its destruction. The beast will be able to identify his followers by the mark of 666. Six, six. All who lack the mark will be known as worshippers of Christ and singled out for special punishment. Did John intend to suggest that a beast would literally appear and that a seven-headed monster would actually walk the earth? The majority of theologians believe the beast to be a symbol of the power of Roman authority that threatened the lives of Christians and seduced them from the faith. The beasts of Revelation certainly are the Roman Empire, but I don't think it's a literal kind of one-to-one -one correspondence that, that you're supposed to figure out, you know, who is each of these beasts, but it certainly is overall a critique of Rome, no question about that. Throughout, many Christians have seen the beast as representing not Rome, but another of God's enemies, the Antichrist. This figure came to have great significance in the history of religion. The anti means uh, uh, false parallel or opposition. And as Christ was love and holiness and purity and sacrifice, so Antichrist will be just the opposite. The debate continues. But all parties agree that the Bible makes it clear that God will not allow this malign force to succeed indefinitely. God will not tolerate the arrogance of evil indefinitely. Uh, something will happen, it will be provoked by the arrogance of an earthly king, and that arrogance of the earthly king, the Antichrist, will finally provoke God's decisive uh, movement to bring in the kingdom of God on earth. After seven years' rule, the beast, or Antichrist, will be instructed by the devil to do battle with Christ to decide who will dominate the earth. The beast will assemble his army in a wide valley that was the scene of many battles in the Bible. The place is named in Revelation as Armageddon. This famous site that John predicts for the future actually exists in Israel today. It is a place of extensive archaeological work. The site is called Armageddon. We're standing on the very spot that John said the great battle between good and evil would take place. This is Megiddo. This is Armageddon. Har Megiddo means the mound or mountain of Megiddo. And from Har Megiddo we get Armageddon. From Armageddon we get Armageddon. 
Now, it's no coincidence that John chose this particular site uh, for this great final battle because this little valley, the Jezreel Valley, has seen more battles than any other place on earth. In the last 4,000 years, there have been 34 battles fought uh, in this small piece of land. The names of the people who have fought and died here reverberate throughout history. The Egyptians, the Persians, the Mamelukes, Napoleon, all fought battles in this valley. John knew what he was doing in putting the Battle of Armageddon here, just as if uh, we were to mention to an American the Battle of Gettysburg or the Battle of Shiloh. So a mere mention of Armageddon or Megiddo uh, would have evoked uh, images of uh, past glory and future revenge to any Christian audience that would have been reading John's writings.